This is Leadership in Action, and I'm Mark Stiles, your host. Join me as we delve deep into the passions, expertise, and experiences of Boston area innovators. Sponsored by the Boston Chapter of Entrepreneurs Organization, this is Leadership in Action. Hey, folks, welcome back to Leadership in Action, your Boston Chapter of EO's podcast. Today's guest is an articulate and personable leader with over 25 years of experience in the talent advisory business sector, focusing on C-suite leadership acquisition and leadership development. He's a frequent speaker on leadership assessment and selection. He has the right process, people, and ability to target candidates as good as they get. He's been an EO member since, drum roll please, 2001. He's the co-founder and managing director at Boston Search Group, also known as BSG. Please meet, or better yet, be reacquainted with Clark Waterfall. Welcome to the show, Clark. Uh, thanks so much, Mark. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So let's get right to it. Question number one, what is the most positive lesson you've learned while running a business? Oh, this is going to sound incredibly cliched. You know, it's it's two two edges of a sword. Uh, number one, that that people are amazing, right? Companies are run on people as much as AI may, uh, you know, transform that in the future. And so, you know, getting them right is just a joy. Um, the learning curve to get them right, wildly painful. I hear that. And you know what I hear too is cliche. It's funny. I've been thinking about that word a lot lately. And, you know, why is it cliche? Well, because it's accurate and used a lot because it's the right terminology. It's the right word. So it's the people. Tell us more about the people, the right people, the right seats. Like, how do you, how do you figure that out? Yeah. And, and I'm conflicted in this because, you know, we, it's, it, it, the irony is not lost on me that, you know, if we had a hard time uh, working up the learning curve of finding the right people and getting them in the right seats, um, how are we to help our clients? Um, because that is, you know, for the most part, our value proposition, finding them and then tuning them. So I, there's a, you know, sometimes maybe the excuse I would attach would be, Hey, you know, the cobbler's children never have shoes right. and, you know, it's hard to see oneself versus seeing others. There, there are lots of excuses I could make. The, the bottom line is I think it's just a lot of reps, right? You know, the more, the, the more you do it wrong and reflect uh, maybe the, the more likely you are to, to do it right. There was a famous ATP tennis player who had tattooed on, I think the inside of his forearm, um, fail better. Mm. Uh, and his name was Stan Wawrinka and Stan was a Swiss, still is a Swiss, you know, player who's won, you know, three of, uh, of the, of the four grand slams. And in that circumstance, you know, maybe, maybe I should have that tattooed probably in more than one place. Because I think when you iterate um, and reflect, then you get the opportunity to you know try it again. So we've had a whole number of different teams, and we're fortunate enough now, I think, after 25 years of iteration and failure, um, probably to have evolved one of the one of the best, if not the best, uh, set of team players that, that we've ever had. But it's really embarrassing. I think I'm just a super slow learner because it took a quarter century. And, you know, if you take, you know, companies like any of the FANG companies, right, Facebook or Apple or, you know, Netflix or Google, you know, they, you know, they, they haven't, uh, maybe Apple, but everyone else was born less than 25 years ago. Look how successful they were. Overnight success, right? Yeah. Poof. You know, it's just <laughs> incredible how, how much more successful they were than, and, and they got the team thing right. You know, not always, but they, they really have focused on team and people and, I think that's great, as well as a whole bunch of other large companies. I was listening to a podcast, I think this morning, one of the board directors from uh, Berkshire Hathaway mm. talking about, you know, people and team, et cetera. And, you know, this is, you know, again, very cliched. I'm embarrassed to, to probably use it, but I think since it is so rawly truthful, 
Uh, I think I just have to, I have to stick to it and own it. Well, isn't that the truth though? It's, it's cliche. It's easy to say, however, is it easy to do? Right. So that's why, that's why we're still in business. Right. It's easy to say it's way harder to do. And so whether we're involved in, you know, helping, you know, companies and usually their middle market private equity investors bring in um, new leadership talent, the acquisition of new talent, or help to tune that talent, right? Just as you tune a combustion engine, again, something that may or may not be uh, around for a lot longer, but tune an instrument, tune anything. You know, tuning is hard. Um, mm. And, you know, the acquisition is is difficult. Tuning is even harder. So is that primarily where you're brought in is through venture capital, private equity. We're putting this, we're putting this together. We need a CEO to fill this seat. Go. Yeah. So our, you know, again, a lot of this has evolved over time. Um, clients have taken us into new industries. Investors have taken us into new geographies. But I think where we've settled into a sweet spot for our focus as a firm is, is what's referred to as middle market private equity backed businesses. Does that mean we don't do publicly traded? No, we just finished a CEO search, found a terrific uh, executive for a, a small cap publicly traded client. Does that mean we don't do family owned, non uh, investor backed? No, we've actually done a whole host of those searches. But in terms of our core focus and sort of the 80 20 rule, I think that. The majority of work we do is for middle market investor backed businesses that are in um, growth mode. You know, there are a couple of versions of private equity. Um, one could be uh, sort of higher risk turnaround. Um, if you think about, you know, the movie uh, Pretty Woman, uh, the Richard Gere character was all around, you know, buy distressed mm -hmm. and, and, and exact value out of that. That's certainly one model where you can make money. I think our focus has very much been on the growth equity side of that. So what are the growth levers that an investor can help deploy with a company in order to, you know, buy it at one revenue number and one profit number, and then value create in order to increase that both usually revenue and profit number, and then sell it either to a strategic or to another sponsor uh, that, that may be growing a, a larger business. How often are you seeing um, the removal or the um, reseeding of the founder when you're coming in to place the C-suite? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. And it's one of the, I think there are, there are a number of different playbooks. Um, I would tell you that the West Coast, uh, and if you go back to, to venture, and this is where I'll get in trouble with you know the the venture relationships that that I've grown and evolved over the years. On balance, um, the West Coast believe it's the power of the and, so it is founder plus non-founder, two in a box. Maybe the non-founder is the CEO and the founder is something else, um, or maybe the non-founder is president or COO and the founder remains CEO. The West Coast, I think, really has sort of a firm belief system around a, you know, two in the box, power of the and. East Coast, a little bit less so in our experience, where it's very much there are different. There's a very well known, you know, venture capital firm in the Boston area uh, that's had, I don't know, probably 12 funds. So they've had a lot of experience and they, you know, built a chart of different phases of company growth and development with a new CEO for each one of those, right? And there's an argument to be made for that where, hey, you're facing a whole new set of challenges and there's this fine line between an ability to have a sitting founder CEO learn. So that's a curve, right? And the growth curve of the company. And if the growth of the company continues to exceed the learning growth of the CEO, founder, they're always playing from behind, right? They're mm -hmm. always playing catch up. They're never crossing over the company growth line, which really puts the, you know, that could put the company at risk. So we are often asked to help supplement again in middle market private equity. Often the founder has 
run started and or run the business either they started it or multi generation generationally took it over um and they're they're at the end and they'd really like to step into a different role board director role chair role um other role innovation role whatever it may be and and you know just like you have a starting pitcher and a closing pitcher in baseball and i think they say hey listen I, it's really tough to be both or be good at both and you get pretty tired like if you have to pitch the whole nine innings so there's a there's a real argument to be said hey let's bring in you know fresh um fresh energy uh, with some different growth stage experience and and marry those up or partner those up middle market defines what in revenue yeah so middle market is usually speaking to ebitda you know okay. the, the metric in private equity is all around earnings before interest taxes depreciation and amortization and that's a there are many who argue that's a bad metric but it is the metric that's used so you know on a revenue side it's harder because each industry you know ge general electric long ago and far away said if we don't have 10% gross profit um uh, or sorry 10% uh sort of profit before carrying costs we want to get out of that business so those are businesses that have tiny you know profit as a percentage and there are biz software businesses or other businesses that have huge profit margins so that impacts top line but if you're talking about ebitda middle market is usually defined by at the low end 5 million in ebitda um annual uh earnings and then usually goes up to you know could be 100 million in ebitda so 5 to 100 if you get then you get into upper middle market if you go above that and revenue that marries to that depending upon the industry could be in a very profitable business with huge margins you know that could be as low as a as a 10 million dollar gross revenue business with a 5 million ebitda um but it also could be a 50 million dollar business right with a with a 10% right when you think about that and that's sort of pretty typical how often is it that you're going from one stage to the next that you're coming in to not replace, but tune up that C-suite where it's where we have a we have a model, we got to the million and but we're going to 20. Yeah. Or we're That's, at 10 and we're going to 50 or 50 to a hundred or so on and so forth. That's usually the inflection point where mm -hmm. either leadership um would benefit from some augmentation or some some change or refresh um private equity usually loves to invest in a leadership team that's really good for the for the now right um so rather than buy something where there's automatically a uh, an expectation that someone's gonna someone or some people in the leadership team need to be changed out they really love to have as much leadership team be carried forward but it's it's when you reach that next inflection point of growth that you may need uh, some supplementation or some replacement uh, or top grading or upgrading or upskilling or any of the euphemisms that are used out in the in the talent marketplace for for bringing in you know, new skills, new people, new ways of doing things, new track record. How often are you recruiting out of a Ret quasi retirement role versus out of a another company very rarely out of quasi retirement okay. you know, usually you know quasi retirement those executives tend to want to stay in retirement um and they usually have an even higher and better use which is either to join as a board director so there's one ceo that that i adore sort of in the pantheon of the 10 best ceos i've ever worked with and she, um, I think, adds most value now as, as a board director across a number of different companies. So she's levering up, right? She can bring her expertise not to a single serially focused CEO responsibility that she'd have, but as a board director across a whole bunch. Another way is having some of these executives sit inside or in parallel to a fund and be uh, sort of a value creation catalyst, right? Hey, I've had all this experience as a CEO or a CFO or whatever I was. And instead of doing it one at a time, I can actually do it over a portfolio of companies that is owned by an investor at any one time. So that those are usually better 
uh, more accretive to both the, the executive, more fulfilling, but as well to the fund and to the companies to sort of spread the love across multiple companies at the same time. We're almost always recruiting from other similar stage, similar industry, similar geography, maybe slightly bigger, right? Because you're going to want to sort of have a step up candidate that has experience with what's in the windshield, where you're driving toward versus either where you're at in the, you know, the, the side windows or, or even worse, where you've been in the rear view. So I, I think that, that certainly private equity backed businesses are unique enough in a number of ways that recruiting private equity backed experienced executives who have that ownership structure, it's private, not publicly traded usually, um, but it's not just private, it's private PE owned or backed. And that comes with a whole set of unique and special requirements, skills, and experience um, that, that would not be easily translatable from, say, multi-generational family owned or whatever it may be. Hmm. So you, tell me gone way into the weeds here, Mark. Well, that's um, okay. Well, that's that's, let you know that. that's kind of should end like up on the go. cutting room floor, is my guess. I don't think so. I think people are going to enjoy this. That is a great segue for my next question, which is 23 years member. You know, what's what's keeping you a member at EO? Yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a question that on the surface seems really obvious to ask, but it's so easy to answer. I guess it's, um, it's three things and I'll end with the most important in my experience, I have found three reasons. Number one, um, I think the, the forum experience is unique and unreplicatable via any other mechanism. And so I've had the good fortune of being in the same forum I was placed, you know, some years ago. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's been fascinating to see forum members come and go as they sell their businesses or step into different roles or, um, or start up new businesses or whatever it may be. But the, the, the forum as a kitchen cabinet is, uh, and, and both for personal and business, I would say that um, I have gotten wild value on both of those pistons or in both of those vectors, personal and business. So mm -hmm. that would be huge. Um, the second is learning, um, not just from form, but it's incredible how you can crowdsource or or collective intelligence or wisdom of crowd, something that you've never faced before, but somebody else has. And so the the EO crucible, you know, whether you're using cool new tools like Slack today or, you know, any of the more real-time communication tools or old tools like email or forums or or God forbid, you know, universities where you go off and you meet folks, um, it's incredible how valuable collective intelligence is. And I don't have every answer to every problem that I've either facing now, faced in the past or will face, but boy, do I have an instant resource where I can get sort of a, a real-time readout on, hey, this works for that or this worked for me. And yes, it's experience sharing and it's gestalt, which I know has been rebranded inside of EO as something else. But um, that's number two. And that is this collective intelligence beyond forum. So forum, wildly valuable, but man, you can lever it over this huge body of entrepreneurs globally that I've done it. I've done it in Barcelona. I've done it in Singapore. I've done it in South America. It's nothing short of stunning. And I guess the third that for me is the most important is the ethos. Um, entrepreneurs are different. Founders are different than any other leadership group personas that may exist out there. And there are, there are a bunch of really great organizations, YPO, Young Presence Organization, Vistage, there are a whole host of these. Um, but what has resonated for me, because I, I was a founder when I had more hair and more hubris 25 years ago, you know, um, when my wife had just had our first child and, you know, we didn't have, you know, two shekels to rub together. That ethos is 
with whom I identify. That's my persona. I am an entrepreneur. You know, it's like I am a runner or I am a triathlete or I am a musician or I am. We all have these multiple personas. I am a father. I am a spouse. I am an entrepreneur and I can have no stronger connection than being put together with another entrepreneur, even if they're a different language, a different culture, a different geography, a different business, a different stage. Um, it's incredible the kismet that occurs when you put two or more entrepreneurs together. What is that? What is that it factor, that recipe, that 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 gene, that like-minded? What is it? Yeah. So, you know, a, a while back when I ended up being far more active in EO leadership, both within the chapter as well as uh, as as regionally and globally, you know, we had the boldly go. We had a bunch of values, and I, I, you know, boldly go, make a mark, doing things differently, um, and and doing things better, innovating. This whole innovation thing doesn't mean you have to be tech, right? You could be a law firm doing things differently. You know, there's a law firm that has been. Uh, a peer of mine within EO that that did a whole nother take on how legal services were provided and delivered. You could be, so it doesn't have to be tech enabled, but that way of, I I, I see a, a different and potentially better way um, is just a driver and a thirst for learning. It's another one of those values that's out there, right? I have yet to meet an entrepreneur that's a meaningfully tenured entrepreneur that, that, doesn't have just this eternal fire for learning. And those things are values around which, and, and we do know, and I know this from our talent tuning or executive tuning side, when you bring a group of humans together that share values, they can be different in almost every other way, race, creed, color, geography, business, doesn't matter. And what really, is the cohesion is the the shared values and that's what's amazing i just find it nothing short of stunning the learning the constant learning the growth the sponging how do you consume do you consume audibly read both yeah, you know, it's, yeah, it's interesting that, uh, you know, the, the American culture has been accused of, uh, you know, trying to refine to the end the, the multitasking lifestyle. <laughs> so and the guilt around doing one thing at a time, sort of the deep work concept that's out there. And there's a lot written around deep work. There's a book out recently focused on deep work. Uh and I'd come up with it if I could in a moment. So um, yet I still think we're we're guilted into needing to multitask. So I am a uh, I am guilty as charged, huge multitasker. I tend to do some, the vast majority of consumption uh, running um, usually, and it's almost all audible on short form stuff so, or, mm -hmm. or short and long form. So long form podcasts, I'm a huge fan of like an hour and a half to two and a half hour podcast, which is a deep dive and interactive between, you know, interviewer and interviewee or subject matter expert um, or books. I, I consuming audibly is probably the single best. And then I do a lot of just straight up reading, but it's usually short form stuff. So, you know, magazine articles, blog posts, that sort of stuff. Or it's just easier to consume it visually than than audible. So, what are you listening to for podcasts? Are there in any industry ones that you dial into, or is it uh, for entertainment? There, there is an industry one actually. Um, for for us on the tuning side, um, there's a, a psychometric psychometric assessment. So, mm -hmm. think about personality profiling on the steroids, and uh, there's a a company or or set of tools that was created by a Bob Hogan and it's called the, the Hogan inventory and the, the chief technology officer, I guess, within that business is, uh, uh, and does a podcast on sort of psychology, but you know, sort of business oriented psychology. And it's, it's a really interesting one. It's called the science of personality. Cool. And, 
the that's out there. I tend to, you know, the three pillars of longevity are, you know, fitness, sleep, and nutrition. And so I tend to listen to a lot of that stuff. So that would be everything from Peter Atia, Dr. Peter Atia, um, Dr. Andrew Huberman, mm. also on the health side, Matt Walker, Dr. Matt Walker, who is the, you know, the guru on sleep. Uh, is phenomenal British accent, um, a little too self-effacing stylistically for me, uh, <laughs> but just incredible learning I've gotten out of all three of those. I would tell you on the business slash life learning side, um, the Knowledge Project by Shane Parrish. Uh, he was the one who was just interviewing this board director, Chris Davis uh, from Berkshire Hathaway. Just fascinating learning. And then Tim Ferriss, you know, Love him or hate him. Um, he's a great interviewer and he gets amazing guests that cross the spectrum. One of the more recent podcasts I think he did was with Claire Hughes Johnson, Claire Hughes Johnson on leadership. So that's an industry topic. Uh, and her book, uh, and I'm forgetting what her book is, is really, really good. I'd encourage anyone to anyone who's interested in sharpening their short around leadership to, to read it, listen to it. But uh, Balaji Srinivasan, Tim Ferriss introduced me to as well, an amazing sort of geopolitical um, analyst, thinker, deep thinker. Uh, I neared the concept of network states, really fascinating stuff. So those would be some of the, you know, some of the, the you know, blue ocean topics that I find really fascinating. But, you know, those are podcasts that are an hour and a half, two hours long, if, if they're a minute. So how long are you out on the road? You lace them up and pick the podcast yeah, and so go. I, I have a I have a rule and that is I can only listen to a podcast half the time I'm out there or content and then I have to ruminate on my own thoughts for the other half so cool. if I'm doing you know six miles in the morning um or a 10k you know you get you get 25 minutes or so listening and then 25 minutes you know trying to construct your own thoughts your own goals your own plans some of them sort of metabolizing and synthesis of maybe what you just heard, et cetera. So that's my rule. And, and fortunately we split, I split time now between Boston and Florida. And so when you run on the beach, uh, when you hit the beach, you got to listen to the ocean. You got to be present. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I was going to ask you is do you, do you first listen to get warmed up, get those endorphins and dopamine rolling and then turn it off or do you Correct. start? Yeah. 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 I think I'm just too weak uh, a personality where yeah, you know, if I have to do it in the inverse and do the heavy lifting, it's like eating. Yeah, you know, I'd much prefer to eat dessert before you know, <laughs> eating, eating the appetizer or entree. So I do dessert first, which is you know a really good catalyst or stimulus to then, like usually as a springboard, you're like, wow, you know that was really cool and interesting. How does that apply to me? What am I going to do with that? Where does that play? And then I try to come home and 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 journal, right? So uh -huh. at the end of that, my you know way more personal than we need to get into, but. Um, you know, immediately after the run, hit the, from the mind to the paper. Try, try Love it. You know, wildly unsuccessful and fail all the time, but, uh, that, that's the goal. Journal that's, and meditate. I love that. I love that. Um, so is that a morning routine for you? Yeah. I mean, anything, there are two comments, anything good that happens usually happens before 8am mm. and nothing good happens after 9 30 PM. So wow, it's a good rule. Yeah. I like that a, rule. Yeah. That, it's my experience. Again, it's only my experience. Maybe people have, you know, wildly counterintuitive uh, experiences where nothing good happens for them before eight in the morning. <laughs> Everything good happens for them after nine thirty. Yeah. I'm, you know, I, I, my experience does not demonstrate that. So I love talking with people who do what you do and asking, what does the future of work look like? three, five, 10 years down the road? There's sort of the meta question for everyone. And then there's the, you know, narrower question for me. And I tend to think at both ends of that barbell to some extent, um, it's, it's exciting and terrifying. The meta question that is, what does the future work look like for, you know, writ large for everyone? Um, on the exciting part, uh, I mean, you can meet with anyone, anywhere, anytime because of technology. So, you know, truly being a global 
citizen or a global corporate um, participant is easier than it's ever been. You used to have to get on a plane and fly, mm -hmm. right? That was you know, before fax, fax, before email, before like that was the only way you could meet or communicate unless you wrote a letter and mailed it. Now you can meet sort of instantaneously, which therefore accelerates learning, right? Global learning, uh, information transfer, um, arbitrage, really, really cool. That's on the plus side of the future of work. Um, I, I think that you can uh, you can also work um, and be far more efficient. You can be more impactful. And if you invested the same 10 hours a day, you should be able to get more out of your 10 hours a day today um, than you did 10 years ago and probably mm -hmm. more out of your 10 hours a day next year or 10 years from now than you do today. So you know, Moore's law, right? The the concept of you know accelerating, um, you know, microprocessors. I can't remember what Moore's law is, but you know, they double every n number of years. Um, the terrifying part of of the way we work now and the way we work forward, perhaps going forward, is the 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 lean into virtual. And I think it's just going to be really hard for next generation leaders to learn leadership. You know, if if everything is done or if a lot more is done virtually versus in person, so much of mentorship, so much of learning is uh, accidental or observational, uh, right place, right time, in the elevator, at the water cooler, you know, in the parking lot, wherever it may be. And that the more we lean on virtual for efficiency, the less opportunity next gen leaders have to learn. And so new tools need to somehow be created in order to maybe it's not replicate, but create a next gen leadership learning pathway. Because today, if you're in a virtual organization, it's super hard um, to learn how to lead. How do you manage people? How do you hire and fire? How do you set goals? What's, you know, how do you deal with, you know, courageous leadership or, uh, or communication, et cetera, really, really hard. And having in-person mentors used to be a lot easier than it, it, uh, it is today. And I think will likely be tomorrow, but once we get, you know, three dimensional avatars and, and VR, maybe it'll all come back and we'll have just a replication of an office just on a, on a set of glasses or a headset. I don't know. See what Apple does. Um, on the personal side, it has given me an incredible freedom. You know, what the the state of work, you know, I've been able to take the firm virtual, which has given me amazing freedom. And so that allows me to, you know, travel probably a quarter of the time for business, be in Florida, you know, more than half the time and be be back in Boston for the balance of that. And then you know, do whatever else needs to happen. It's also allowed us to hire employees, though, that are all over. Uh, geographically, uh, and are at all different stages of their life, we have as a as a value, we have created a firm that is family first, because virtual somehow dovetails really nicely with family first. And there's a lot of argument around, hey, is it customer first, and then employee, and then the business will you know benefit from that workflow? Or is it employee first and then customers and then the company? Usually the company needs to come last, right? It's an inverted pyramid where a company is at the bottom and then either employee or customer um, is up here. And we've taken a pretty you know, employee-centric, employee first with a very close, not second, but perhaps in parallel, you know, client or, or, or customer need um, there. But for us in, in our ability to teach, train, learn, amazing tools that help us be virtual, but productive, um, but professional services, you know, professional talent advisory, advisory businesses are wildly different than making widgets or coding software. So it's, it's, uh, it's unique to us. So, you know, you're working at the C-suite level. Uh, what about the, at the contributor level? I mean, do you envision four day work weeks? Do you envision employee owned companies? Like where are we going with the nine to five W2? Well, you know, guaranteed, um, you know, minimum wage and a bunch of other, you know, there, there are some cool concepts out there. If we have 3D printers that can effectively do construction or build houses, uh, and we have AI that can do a lot of the knowledge work, there is a huge argument to be made 
you know, are we really going to have to work 40 hours? You know, what are we going to do with our time? If our GDP can achieve escape velocity and create this sort of perpetual, um, you know, profit engine, um, what, what's, uh, what's the future of work? Um, I would say that for entrepreneurs, work is purpose. Mm. The one thing I do know as a parent, as well as an entrepreneur, is that without purpose, it, it marries directly to nothing good happens after 9.30 p.m. I would write next to that, in fact, above that, but without purpose, nothing good happens. Yeah. Um, and therefore, uh, I think we can find purpose or we all... And I think the human condition is pretty much driven a priori, you know, whether it's nature or nurture, hard to tell. And whether it's DNA coded or not, I don't have that answer. It's above my pay grade. But we're driven to try to find purpose. Where we have failed to show humans purpose or a pathway to purpose, our children, uh, young adults, young professionals, et cetera, then meism creeps in. And meism is uh is a is a often a pretty ugly reality, uh, whether that be sort of a, you know, basement dwelling, young, often male, um, you know, focused too much on gaming and uh, not enough on finding real meaningful purpose. That's sort of a cliche that's out there, but you can find purpose in philanthropy, purpose in education, purpose in um, learning, purpose in uh, all sorts of different areas, but purpose is just so critical. And it's something that as an entrepreneur, it's easy because we know what our purpose is. And since you, I didn't grow up, I didn't grow up with a lot of money. My first purpose out of, you know, sort of out of the womb was earn money. Um, and once you then sort of work your way up Maslow's hierarchy of needs and you get through food and shelter and uh, a bunch of the other steps, you end up at the top. And there's an argument. There's a, another book out there around what the top, the the capstone on the triangle of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is. And the what what many have wrongly chronicled Maslow as putting at the top is self-discovery mm -hmm. or enlightenment. And evidently Maslow wrote uh, either it came out post-mortem or in papers that purpose ended up, I think, at the top of his pyramid in the way he ultimately conceptualized it as giving back, not just self-discovery, which is still sort of me-istic, but, you know, inverting to then giving to others a lot in eastern religion around that right three phases of of uh of of your life blah 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 so are you raising entrepreneurs uh i i i think it's one of my failures as a parent you know i was a i was a musician early and i therefore didn't want to push my kids into you know, into music. It was a deep passion of mine. I was told I had some ability um, and obviously, you know, took that as a, a long distance, but um, I, I backed away from that. And I also think I backed away from entrepreneurship. I would tell you children of entrepreneurs carry a lot of scar tissue. <laughs> uh, and I don't think mine are any exception to that. I, I think if, if they're around in their upbringing and their, you know, early development while you're you, know, you birth these kids, but you also birth the business and you're trying to raise them all up together. There's a crap ton of scar tissue that's around there. And I think both my kids would say, hey, I hope they would say, hey, I love my dad, but he was not easy to live with. So would my wife, by the way. So would my siblings and my mom. So I think it's universal. So funny. So what instrument did you play or what What was the musical talent? Yeah. So I, I grew up uh, early on. Uh you know, it was, it was either, I was introduced to, to drums by a really incisive uh, music teacher in, in elementary school. And I think my mom figured out that if I didn't channel my energy <laughs> constructively, it would, it would be, you know, uh, channeled destructively. So I ended up, uh, uh, you know, being really focused on, on drums, percussion, the whole family of instruments. Uh, and then ended up going to Newton Conservatory of Music, uh, wow. Tufts University at the same time. Sort of schizophrenic. What do I want to do um, when I grow up? I still don't know. But um, at that point in time, really focused on on performing. That's really cool. Well, it sounds like uh, it, it, it paid its dividends, right? So you're running the orchestra and now you're running the, the businesses for people. Oh, nice metaphor, yeah. Mark. I, 
you know, I, uh, it's why you get paid the big bucks because <laughs> you, you pulled that one out, Tim Ferriss. Yeah. Well, he's the OG right there. I heard you, I uh, heard you call him out. Um, so, you know, busy, you're doing some running. What else do you do for fun? Yeah. So, uh, I'm sure this now, nah, actually it's politically incorrect. So I'm going to withdraw and rephrase what I was about to say. Tennis is, is a huge passion. It's been a passion. I was you know really into tennis when I was younger, up through high school, and then parked it for 20 years while I built a business and a family and then came back at it. Um, for any anyone who's passionate about tennis, we've run for 15 years or so, a uh, uh, charity tournament at, at uh, on the green grass courts in Longwood. I can't name them, but uh, if anyone knows tennis and or Googles it, you should be able to find it. Every September, we bring together our ecosystem, which are investors and operators or builders of companies, runners of companies, in sort of a Davis Cup-like, you know, smack-talking, um, uh, philanthropic endeavor uh, one afternoon every fall uh, out, at, out in Chestnut Hill. And so tennis has been a huge passion, both professionally uh, in order to try to get it woven into what I do, um, but just personally. So watching it, uh, Tennis Channel is my favorite channel kids and and spouse would would you know 100 percent attest to that and then i try to play as much as possible again florida makes that a lot easier in the winter uh wild number of passionate tennis players tons of places to play um you know the problem is fitting in work around tennis if you if you aren't too careful because you can just get sucked right into the matrix of you know tennis passion and so that is one um you know i had a for when my wife was pregnant with our first child got into triathlon i think as much as a governor of all the emotions that come with uh you know a, a burgeoning family and and ran that for uh no pun intended for for a, a bunch of years till covid and um i think i've just lost the i've lost the edge as maverick would say another cool community right eo being a community of entrepreneurs but the triathlon community is a really really cool and inclusive community as well it has been, you know, some really amazing people. Um, again, I think, you know, tennis players, um, triathletes share a lot in common, sort of adversity, stamina, um, endurance, all these sorts of things are really important. But yeah, super cool community. I've learned a lot. You know, I'm just an age grouper. So, uh, you know, it keeps me, it keeps me out of trouble. It keeps me fit. Again, in those three pillars of, you know, sleep, nutrition, exercise, it's, uh, you know, it, it's a forced I mean, you, you got to exercise if you're going to do any of that stuff. Agreed. Hey, so Clark, how would someone connect with you? Yeah, that's that's it's a little bit harder for me, only because there's a big top of funnel in the business that mm. that we are in. There are there are a lot of people who, um, who reach out and want to connect, and and I will tell you that I fail miserably at responding to everyone who who does or wants to, and for that I apologize abjectly. However, I would say LinkedIn is probably the easiest, uh, you know, gateway point or entry point. Uh, I think LinkedIn for me is uh, just my name, Clark Waterfall. So it's LinkedIn.com forward slash IN forward slash Clark Waterfall. And, and you know, sending out a, a DM there would be great. Cool. Well, this has been really great. And I appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge and share your experiences with EO and to our audience. I really appreciate you, Clark. Hey, thanks so much for having me. And again, thanks to the the greater EO community for having me over these last 23 years. Hopefully, uh, yeah, I can hang in there for a few more. Folks, thanks for listening. We appreciate you listening. If you thought of somebody, share this with them. You know what? Share it with everyone. Have a great one, folks. Be well. Leadership in Action is sponsored by the Boston chapter of the Entrepreneurs Organization. As the world's only peer-to-peer -peer network exclusively for entrepreneurs, EO helps transform the lives of those who transform the world.